All right. So, Dr. P, thank you so much for joining us again. Yeah, hi. Uh, as usual, uh, there are people, I'm sure, who've uh, just turned the radio on, perhaps have never heard your voice or don't know anything about you. So would you please uh, just give us a rundown of your academic and professional career? Um, I've been interested in nutrition uh, for many years. And uh, for between 1968 and 1972, I studied biology at the University of Oregon, uh, concentrated on uh, the chemistry and physiology of aging, especially the reproductive system. And uh, that got me interested in uh, many related processes. Uh, uh, before uh, I went to graduate school, I lived in Mexico and was interested in uh, the, the uh, economics of nutrition and how to uh, optimize good nutrition on minimum income, and I saw that uh, the ancient Indian civilization had uh, made some great technological advances in uh, processing corn. Corn normally has uh, quite a few toxins in it, but uh, they discovered that uh, cooking it with uh, uh, lime, calcium hydroxide, uh, made it more edible and less toxic. And uh, so the traditional diet there was extremely rich in calcium, just as part of the tortilla and other uh, processed corn. Uh, and, and that turns out to be something that's increasingly of interest uh, to the uh, biochemists of, of aging in the last five or ten years. Uh, phosphate had sort of been ignored for about a hundred years in biology because it was sort of like water to a fish. It's, it's always there. And uh, the inorganic form of it is usually just considered as sort of uh, the raw material from which you uh, activate proteins or form uh, adenosine triphosphate, uh, the energy-containing molecule and so on. But uh, recently, uh, the inorganic phosphate in itself is turning out to be uh, very central to all metabolic processes. So how were the South Americans um, making the lime? They were just mil uh, mining limestone? Uh, yeah, you burn limestone and uh, then soak it in water and uh, cook your corn in basically a almost pure calcium hydroxide. And that partly it, it makes soap out of the fatty acids, and so it removes the toxic, unsaturated fats, uh, which interfere with hormones, and uh, it uh, changes some of the amino acids. Uh, ordinary corn uh, tends to have too much leucine, and uh, that contributes to some of the toxic symptoms, but it's uh, normally deficient in uh, some of the vitamins, and it happens that the, the lime process converts tryptophan to niacin, and so it's mm. it's like a, a niacin vitamin supplement, and that's why uh, uh, the uh, nutrition diseases that occurred in the U.S. southern states among uh, people who lived largely on corn never occurred in the traditionally Indian cultures. Because mm. you've, uh, you, you've uh, warned, I think it's the right kind of word, but uh, against tryptophan as being a potentially uh, harmful uh, product. I yeah, know, and, and the process of turning it to niacin uh, happens to uh, be very important in regulating uh, phosphate, which mm. otherwise would be uh, uh, one of the toxic features of any grain, cereals, beans, seeds of any sort, uh, have a very high ratio of phosphorus to calcium. And so they're not only adding calcium, but they're uh, giving uh, a means for um, regulating your, cal your phosphate more perfectly because niacin happens to uh, be an antiphosphate <laughs> nutrient. 
Cool. So is there a recipe that they follow, or is it pretty much just like trial and error when they uh, take dried corn and boil it with some lime? Yeah. Uh, the recipe seems to be a big kettle full of corn and a big spoonful full of lime and uh, cook it until the uh, shells pop off the corn. The little transparent husk loosens as the corn kernel swells up and becomes hominy. Mm. And so when it, it looks like hominy, you uh, stir it a little to separate the cellulose husks. And traditionally, they would let it stand in that liquid for a day. And uh, that makes sure that the process uh, is well. Would you be able to do the similar thing with fire ashes? Uh, yeah, that... Uh, Probably is is better for some of the nutrients, and it, it makes a very uh, delicious product. Uh, corunda is one of the tortilla or one of the tamale-like foods made with ashes instead of of uh, yeah. the calcium. Because now you said uh, I picked up on what you said about the fatty acids, and this is like uh, saponification in soap making. You said that this, the fatty acids that are uh, normally something that you'd want to keep down are actually uh, esterified, I guess, by the uh, the process. And so that is similar to soap making? Um, yeah, I, I don't know if they originally used the stuff for washing their clothes, but yeah. it, it is like a soapy solution yeah. that they pour off after the <laughs> cool. ending. Well, when I was visiting the mountains of Mexico and watching them make their different corn preparations they used ashes for a certain type of product and lime for different types and i couldn't quite understand what it, which ones used which but um, they were very specific that the the ashes were only for certain types uh, yeah they, they're both very delicious <laughs> they were all very delicious <laughs> all, all right. many types <clears throat> Well, the main the main thrust of uh, I think where we want to um, go with the uh, the topic this evening is I know that you've done a lot of research and you've said uh, time and time again aging as, as a as a kind of broad based subject and I think the fact the feature of um, the uh, tonight's discussion about ino- inorganic phosphate and how prevalent it's become in today's commercial food industry and we'll get into the reasons why in a bit uh, and the and the uh, the uh, pathology that comes from it that we we'll also get into is uh, is pretty interesting because the uh, aging process I think is inherently something that most people would like to try and stave off as long as possible uh, and stay as healthy as possible because everything that we do if we're not careful it contributes to degeneration and oxidation and the aging process so can you talk a little bit about the uh, age related changes that occur with inorganic phosphate um, consumption and, and where the bulk of people's inorganic phosphate is coming from? Uh, well, the, the main sources are, are meat and seeds, beans and nuts, uh, uh, whole wheat, uh, much more than, than a refined, uh, white flour or, uh, white uh, polished rice. Those have the uh, germ removed, and the germ contains most of the phosphate. So it sounds funny to say that uh, white rice and, and white bread have advantages, but nutritionally they do. Because they also don't have the PUFA, the polyunsaturated fatty acids. Yeah, and and other toxins as well. But uh, the, the vegetable source of calcium that has the least phosphate would be leaves. And so uh, since cows naturally uh, prefer to eat a lot of leaves, uh, cow's milk uh, has a very good ratio of calcium to phosphorus. So what kind of ratio, just talking about ratios for a minute, Dr. Pete, what kind of ratio would you be looking at as a good ratio? Well, milk and cheese are about 1.3 to 1. 1.3 1.3 to 1, okay. And uh, human milk is much better. Uh, I think if cows weren't given grain supplements, that right. their milk would have an even higher ratio. So do you think a grass-fed milk, or a cow that's grass-fed producing milk is going to be producing a milk with lower phosphate levels than a grain-fed cow? Yeah, I think so. Hmm. And uh, a lot of 
people <clears throat> um, habitually eat a ratio of uh, roughly five, six, or seven times as much phosphate as wow. calcium, wow. or probably shouldn't uh, exceed about two parts of phosphate for each calcium. And if you stick to a, a mostly milk and cheese centered uh, diet for your proteins, uh, you'll stay close to a one to one ratio. Yeah. So uh, we were talking earlier, Dr. Pete, about how many milligrams of calcium is in a, a what you daily what you recommend for a daily amount of milk. Like if someone had three pints of milk a day, they'd get two thousand milligrams of calcium, and the um, amount of phosphate that would be the maximum amount they'd want to take in. Um, in a quart, you get about um, twelve hundred and somewhere around <clears throat> twelve hundred, twelve fifty of uh, calcium and just under a thousand of uh, phosphate. So a quart and a half, you'd have uh, around one and a half grams of phosphate. And so we were talking about how much meat would be the maximum amount you want to eat per day or grains or whole grains or legumes, beans. Uh, probably something like half a pound would be tolerable. And then if you wanted to put some eggs and cheese in there, then maybe and a little less than half a pound. Yeah, you have to displace one phosphate source with the other. So this is, this is uh, and uh, again, I'd, I want to make sure that listeners are aware that we're not anti-vegetarianism neither are we pro meat eating because they all have their benefits and their and their costs so um in terms of the phosphate load uh meats you said are, are a fairly high source of phosphate um yeah uh, and the um the calcium in meat is very low it's uh, right. as high as 10 to 1 for right. uh, phosphate over calcium so would you like to just uh, describe the kind of cellular aging effects of phosphate and how how uh, we as consumers of phosphate, if we're not careful, can be harming ourselves? In the last few years, uh, a strange mutant mouse was discovered. They named it Clotho for a, a Greek fate. Uh, and uh, the, this mutant mouse uh, aged very rapidly and had most of the features of human aging, uh, uh, such as uh, decreased lung function, uh, uh, respiratory uh, failure, uh, hardening of the arteries, osteoporosis, wrinkling of the skin, um, all of the basic things that we think of as aging. Mm -hmm. uh, calcification, generally, deposition of calcium phosphate where it shouldn't be while taking it out of the bones where it should be huh. right okay so that, that's the that's the aging process in general you've just uh, summarized so excess dietary phosphate is one of the factors that is involved in aging of many different um, organs and disease processes yeah and a lack of the nutrients such as niacin which uh, help to get it out of the body and keep it from being absorbed so, so freely. Hmm. Okay, there's uh, an article that I was uh, looking at earlier on that uh, mentioned the the link between lung cancer and uh, an increased in inorganic phosphate uh, consumption. The uh, I'd say a little bit about the uh, industrialized food production and... Um, the inorganic phosphate that's used in the production of foods and, and why. I maybe a lot of people don't even know it. Oh, I think it was probably in the 60s when they started finding that, uh, I think it was because the government uh, started regulating the adulteration of, of meats. Uh, they had been uh, simply adding salt water uh, in huge amounts. Uh, they started regulating uh, how much water they could put in meat. And uh, they started uh, defining the chemicals that could be used. And it turned out that phosphate, uh, various forms, polyphosphate and uh, phosphate salts, uh, were effective for making meat hold more water. And uh, 
once that was approved, it became very standard. And so uh, all of the, uh, the things you buy in delicatessens are likely to be hydrated. Ham now is, is I think, unless you have it specially made, it's going to be hydrated with something like 15% extra weight. Wow. Uh, so they, they charge for it as if it was all meat. <laughs> right. But makes it much more profitable. And also in the diapers underneath pieces of meat in grocery stores that have pre-cut pieces of meat for sale are usually very waterlogged. And uh, they can <coughs> give these chemicals to animals and cause them to have edema at the time they slaughter them. And uh, that counts as the starting weight. Then they can add 15% beyond that. So if, if you have very edematous animals, your meat is even more profitable. Because fresh meat that's just, you know, untreated and butchered up does not leak water. I mean, you were mentioning, Dr. Pete, that it's hard to fry a steak anymore because you put it in the pan and it ends up being boiled <laughs> steak and not fried. Yeah, in the 50s, I like to uh, have a fried ham with eggs for breakfast. But starting in the 60s, I found that I couldn't get anything but boiled ham. Just put it on the frying pan and it would just fill up the pan with water. So I guess unless it's like a prosciutto that's been dry cured, it's probably injected with a lot of water. That's probably why prosciutto is so expensive then. Yeah, and this generally means that you're getting a tremendous extra amount of phosphate. So not only is meat already high in phosphate, then they add extra phosphate to it. Yeah. So this is why they're noticing five to six times dietary intake of phosphate. So I guess with people eating either meat and eggs and dairy or, or you know, meat, and eggs and cheese and then whole grains and legumes, they're going to be getting phosphate. So let's talk a little bit about the best sources of calcium to balance this phosphate. Uh, in, in plant materials, leaves really are a great source of calcium because they, turnip greens, for example, have about 10 times as much calcium as phosphate. Others, not quite as much. Uh, but uh, th then you have to choose your leaves according to the toxins that you want to minimize. The cabbage family is antithyroid, and uh, some leaves, uh, well, all leaves have a fairly high unsaturated fat content, and that can interfere with protein digestion. Uh, so if you uh, can process the, the leaves ideally, then you can get very good nutrition out of, out of leaves, high protein and high calcium. Otherwise, uh, milk and cheese are pretty much the, the alternative sources, unless you want to grind up eggshells and uh, that's basically pure calcium, uh, calcium carbonate. Yeah, I also like to recommend nettle leaf steeped overnight because it has quite a lot of calcium. I think it's like a thousand milligrams per half cup of leaves that are soaked in a quart of water overnight. Yeah, if you boil any of these leaves, turnip leaves, for example, you can just boil them quickly, get out most of the calcium and then throw away the leaf and have a good supplement. And I know you've mentioned that baking soda added to chard and spinach helps to block the oxalic acid and to release the minerals from the cellulose fibers? Uh, yeah, and it happens that the baking soda uh, has uh, some of the same benefits that niacin amide has. Uh, it helps your body to excrete uh, phosphate uh, more easily. And anything that helps your body make carbon dioxide uh, uh, helps to excrete phosphate. And uh, salt and calcium happen to stimulate the production of carbon dioxide. And so foods that are high in, in uh, uh, calcium and uh, moderate in, in sodium will help to uh, get rid of any excess phosphate. 
Okay, well, you're listening to Ask Your Herb Doctor uh, from 7.30 until 8 o'clock at the end of the show. Uh, people are welcome to call in with any questions. Uh, we're very pleased to have Dr. Raymond Peet with us on the show tonight. Um, the number here, if you live in the area, is 923-3911, or if you live outside the area, the toll-free number is 1-800-KMUD-RAD. Okay, so I just wanted to continue this with um, talking about the uh, link between calcification um, which can occur in the vessels or in the tissues uh, and the kind of um, rigidity that people get in the vessels as a result of calcified uh, arterioles etc and uh, kidney kidney disease that can come about as a result of uh, phosphate overload or, or the burden on the kidneys with phosphate uh, consumption um, so, Dr. Pete, what do you uh, what do you say? What do you have to say about people that want to try and uh, do something about eating better and main, maintaining a more healthy ratio of their uh, phosphate to uh, calcium intake? Well, lots of, of doctors for years have recommended cutting down on your calcium intake to avoid <laughs> calcification, but uh, actually, that's uh, the same sort of reasoning that. Uh, they know that calcium excites cells, and so they say cut down uh, calcium if you have seizures or high blood pressure or or whatever. But it turns out that uh, that's a whole aspect of calcium that has been neglected. If you are deficient in calcium, you tend to get cramps, uh, might have seizures, uh, bronchial spasms, and asthma. The lack of calcium excites tissues, turns on the excitotoxic uh, mediators, triggers inflammation, and sets up the conditions for depositing calcium. So uh, when you're low in calcium in your diet, you're setting up conditions, increasing the parathyroid hormone, for example, to take calcium out of your bones make up for what you're not eating and the parathyroid hormone releases serotonin among other things and histamine uh, causing more inflammation more calcification of the tissues more tendency for the calcium to combine with phosphate and settle into the arteries kidneys uh, brain cells everywhere except the bones so a calcium deficient diet is really associated with a lot of different inflam- inflammation and the stimulation of a lot of inflammatory mediators. Yeah, and in in fact, um, the uh, tone of the uh, small arteries is uh, very responsive to calcium. So if you're low in calcium, your blood pressure goes up. And for about 30 years, David McCarran has been saying it's not sodium that causes high blood pressure, it's calcium deficiency. Deficiency, right. And, and so eating extra calcium can often uh, cure hypertension or, or avoiding excess phosphate in the diet uh, or a good ratio. Uh, for example, one of the things that started getting me interested in phosphate was looking at the fat-free diet that George Burr and the group did in the 1930s. Mm-hmm. They believed that unsaturated fatty acids were nutritionally essential. So mm-hmm. one other group, uh, William Brown, uh, went on a six-month fat-free diet, uh, where his diet consisted of nothing but uh, a total of 2,500 calories a day, made up basically of sugar syrup <laughs> for several meals. <laughs> And for supper, uh, fat-free cottage cheese with a, a small potato starch biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> apple and half an orange. An apple and half an orange, okay. Uh, so basically, it was a, a sugar and and a milk diet. Wow. A, a gallon total of milk, some of it made into cottage cheese for his dinner. Mm-hmm. and For six months. Yeah, and he had chronically had lifelong migraine headaches every week. And uh, at at work, he 
experienced a normal amount of fatigue at the end of the day, and he had hypertension, 150 over 100 sometimes, Mm -hmm. and his cholesterol was 250, and he was about 10 pounds overweight. But a few months into the uh, diet, the sugar and milk diet, his cholesterol had come down about 50 points, his weight stabilized about 10 pounds lower, his blood pressure came down to normal, and he never again had migraine headaches. Wow. Even after he started back he, on his well, normal... He, well, he probably never went back to normal, yeah, probably. Yeah, <laughs> and one of the things they kept talking about in the article was that, surprisingly, at the end of the workday, he wasn't tired. <laughs> <laughs> and so the fat-free diet was actually good for him. Yeah, the, but it was a high calcium mm-hmm. diet, essentially, and, right. and with that ratio of 1.3 to, to 1 of calcium to phosphorus. And several years ago, a group at the Linus Pauling Institute uh, wrote a review of uh, the importance of of, um, avoiding fructose, I think was their point. Mm -hmm. But they cited the study in which uh, I I think it was 10 or 11 men were put on a a diet emphasizing sugar. I I think they used uh, decaffeinated Coke with uh, the uh, high fructose corn syrup as the main carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. Every meal had a a cola drink. And uh, for some reason, they, knowing that human requires 400 milligrams of magnesium every day, they put these men on 165 milligrams. And they were wanting to prove that uh, a, a fructose diet would cause derangement of the mineral metabolism, Mm -hmm. and in fact, it did, but in a very surprising way. On a a magnesium-deficient diet, these men went into a positive magnesium balance, meaning that some part of their body was retaining a little extra magnesium every day, like they were growing, Mm -hmm. and also it retained a little extra calcium like they were growing, but the derangement caused by the phosphate was a slight loss of uh, phosphate every day. It went into into a negative phosphate balance. Hmm. And to do that, uh, you can account for increasing calcium and magnesium while losing phosphate. I think only if they were turning over their bones and uh, young bone is formed <clears throat> formed from uh, carbon dioxide and calcium, making uh, calcium carbonate as the first bone, which is then replaced with phosphate during aging. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they were losing phosphate while gaining magnesium and calcium. <clears throat> I think that meant that they were building new bone. Wow. <laughs> and that was on a high fructose diet. Yeah. We, we do actually have a caller on the air, so let's take this uh, first caller, Dr. Pete. Hello? Yeah, you're on the air? Yes, um, I'm, I'm aging, and of course, so my, my book is concerned is uh, arthritis, is stiffness in the joints and in the back. And so I'm not too sure what kind of diet or what I've been doing that is not conducive, although I move around, and I do have sometimes, I have days where I'm more fluid than other days. Anyway, I was wondering whether the good doctor could uh, give me some advice or whatever, and I, I'll take it off the uh, off the phone. Okay, thanks for your call. Yeah. Dr. P, did you get that? Yeah, uh, reducing the phosphate intake or getting a, a good ratio, uh, ideally uh, not much over 2 to 1 in relation to calcium, I think is important. And uh, that closely relates to thyroid. Uh, I think the... The polyunsaturated fats, which interfere with thyroid function and uh, steroid function, uh, they interfere with progesterone production, for example. They happen to also lower calcium in the blood. Hmm. So when you're under stress, uh, your calcium goes down and tends to deposit because 
specifically of the increased uh, free fatty acids. Uh, and uh, so cutting down the uh, unsaturated fats in the diet will help to improve your um, calcium ratio and your thyroid function and other steroids which are anti-inflammatory. So um, an equivalent of like three pints of milk a day would provide 2,000 milligrams of calcium or, you know, <clears throat> a couple glasses of milk with some eggshell powder or oyster shell powder or boiled greens. Those are all good ways, but trying to get to about 2,000 milligrams of calcium would be a good start for upping your calcium level and then keeping your whole grains and beans to not more than 8 ounces a day or your meat not more than 8 ounces a day. So basically like 8 ounces of your protein source would be a good ratio for your calcium to phosphate. And another thing I wanted to mention is eggshell powder. If you take a quarter teaspoon three times a day, that's about 2,000 milligrams with your meals. Okay, so you're listening to uh, Ask Your Rev Doctor on KMUD Garberville 91.1 FM. Uh, from now until 8 o'clock, uh, callers are invited. Uh, the number here, if you live in the area, is 923-3911. Or if you live outside the area, the toll-free number is 1-800-KMUD-RAD. So uh, we're pleased to be joined by Dr. Raymond Pete uh, again with us this evening. Um, so, Dr. Pete, the uh, recommendations that have uh, recently been coming out that um, phosphate uh, be lowered as an additive in food because it's a matter of concern and it's a potential health Im- impact. Do do you think um, do you think industry is listening to that? I think they all find some other way to make uh, meat way more, some other way to get it to hold water. Yeah, as... but I'm afraid that one of those might be. The uh, gluey, oh, such as carrageenan or gums, uh-huh. that's already uh, in practice where they take uh, waste fragments of meat or fish and uh, add a jelly, such as carrageenan or alginate, mm-hmm. and then glue the whole mess together oh, with uh, an enzyme that, that glues proteins together so it looks like a, a real lamb chop or or a squid patty or whatever. Right, these are kind of the reconstituted uh, reconstituted meats. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, there is actually another caller on the air, so let's take this next caller, Dr. Pete. Hi, you're on the air? Hello. Yeah, you're on the air. I had a question. I just started listening about 30 or 40 minutes ago, and you were talking about these sources um, being inorganic. So would organic whole wheat pasta or organic meats have less phosphate? Um, no, and unless they, it's a matter of whether they have added it to one product and not to the other, but uh, the way the animal is fed uh, depends uh, more on whether it uh, has a, a lot of grass versus grains. Uh-huh. Uh, the, the, the grains can be organic, but they're still very high in phosphate, and so the animal will will be slightly poisoned by eating them. So, okay. so um, grass-fed meat and milk from cows that are grass-fed will have a lower phosphate level than meat and milk from cows that are grain-fed. But grains are because grains are very high in phosphate. So, whole wheat pasta would be higher in phosphate than white pasta. Okay, I think when we uh, mentioned it at the beginning of the show, when that listener might have called in, I think there might have been some uh, confusion between the inorganic phosphate that occurs in food and the naturally occurring phosphates. So uh, I think that may have been part of the reason. The phosphate they yeah. add to waterlog the meat versus the phosphate that's naturally occurring yeah. in the grains yeah. and the meat itself. Okay. Yeah. I f- uh, yeah, Great, in, thank you. In, in physiology, when you say uh, that, the organic phosphate is um, a protein with a phosphorus group on it or the ATP molecule or such. Uh, when that releases the phosphate, you call it inorganic just because it's not attached to another molecule. But we're constantly uh, making our own inorganic phosphate molecules. Okay. All right. So to continue the uh, to, to continue the discussion about the addition of uh, 
<laughs> phosphate to meats in order to bulk them up. And the uh, link between phosphates and aging as uh, decreased cell function, increased calcification. I know you've mentioned before in the past, and I uh, We've had a couple of shows on calcium and how important calcium is and the uh, misnomer that uh, increased calcium will cause uh, calcification where it's actually the opposite. You said that it's possible to reverse the uh, calcific uh, aortic stenosis, say, or the uh, arterial calcification. What commonly referred to hardening of the arteries. Yeah, hardening of the arteries. Um, yeah, the Japanese have uh, done studies using just vitamin K, uh, and uh, very high doses of it uh, very effectively rebuild osteoporotic bones while taking uh, calcium out of arteries in their animal studies. Uh, but uh, vitamin K is working on cellular energy and uh, specifically on the handling of, of uh, carbon dioxide as a group that uh, lets the um, proteins handle calcium and uh, things that increase your carbon dioxide work right along with uh, vitamin K in helping to keep the uh, uh, calcium and phosphate in your bones rather than in your arteries. Even baking soda helps to build strong bones and uh, in in the way it's acting, it's the same as um, vitamin K or niacinamide. It's uh, helping the kidneys to excrete uh, phosphate that you don't need, uh, helping to deposit uh, calcium and phosphate in the bones while taking it out of arteries. Okay. All right. You've also mentioned, uh, I know in the past, the uh, link between uh, parathyroid hormone and calcium, how, the, how that calcium and phosphate uh, metabolism should be treated by looking at any underlying uh, hyperparathyroidism. Um, yeah, people who uh, have good thyroid function and get enough calcium in their diet have uh, a pretty low parathyroid hormone activity. Right. Towards the, uh, it's the low end of what's now considered the normal range. Uh, uh, at the middle of the so-called normal range, uh, people tend to suffer uh, inflammatory diseases, muscle pains, bone loss, and so on. And uh, the higher the parathyroid is, the more of these degenerative inflammatory diseases you have. And the first way to suppress that excess parathyroid is by eating enough calcium, uh, but also uh, vitamin D, that's the next most important thing. So if somebody doesn't get enough calcium in their diet or vitamin D from the sunshine or from a supplement, then they will be eating their bones. Uh, yeah. Uh, in an experiment with animals 35 years ago, uh, they put uh, one group on a starchy diet, the other group with only sugar as the carbohydrate, and the vitamin D deficiency. And the ones on the regular starchy diet had very weak uh, atrophied bones because they weren't getting enough vitamin D to handle the calcium. But in that study, the sugar diet built strong bones despite the deficiency in vitamin D. And when you look at the, uh, the uh, experiment at the Linus Pauling Institute or the William Brown experiment, uh, sugar was um, lowering phosphate, and um, apparently that accounted for the the sugar making up for a vitamin D deficiency. It, it uh, helps to handle calcium properly by uh, helping to avoid excess uh, phosphate. Do you, so. do you think any of this uh, any of this can be a uh, energy driven process from the sugar being directly uh, a, as a, a fuel to for cellular respiration and um, yeah it it shifts uh, as they saw in William Brown's uh, study uh, the high sugar diet with calcium increased his production of carbon dioxide uh, when he started the experiment his metabolic rate was. 10 or 12 percent below normal. Uh, when he got on that diet, it came up almost to normal. 
and his production of carbon dioxide or respiratory quotient was higher than it had ever been. <laughs> and and so, this, this would be measured by his uh, basal body temperature, right? That would be a good way for people to assess their own metabolic rate. Yeah, that's the quickest way yeah. to look at it. Yeah. And also monitoring their carbon dioxide on blood tests. And the other thing we were talking about earlier today, Dr. Reed, was the phosphorus in the blood, or the phosphate in the blood. And there are some uh, comprehensive metabolic panels that include phosphate in the blood, and there's a range of like 2.5 to 4.5 milligrams per deciliter. And uh, you were suggesting that it's better if it's between 2 and 3. I, yeah, William Browns was 4 when he started and uh, came down to 2.7 to 3, I think it was. So that's another way people can monitor the phosphate levels in their blood. So in the wintertime, do you suggest that people eat more sugars because of the decreasing daylight hours and the decreased vitamin D exposure? I think uh, yeah, it helps the, to activate the thyroid, too. Your liver needs uh, sugar to uh, convert thyroxin into the active T3 hormone. And I think people tend to crave sweets more in the winter, which is an adaptive uh, instinct. Okay, I think we have a, a caller. Hello? Hi, you're on the air. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, I am curious. I have low thyroid function and I have a low body temperature, like down in 97. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if that is what you are talking about, if you have any suggestions for that. Yeah, it's very much. Dr. Pete? Uh, and yeah. I'll, go, I'll get off the air, okay? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, sometimes if you have um, eaten things that suppressed your thyroid, <clears throat> sometimes just a, a deficiency of protein can uh, create a, a low thyroid state. But usually polyunsaturated fats or too much of, of the um, cabbage family vegetables, uh, too many beans and grains, uh, all these have some antithyroid agents. Uh, changing your diet away from those towards uh, the, the uh, fruit uh, and uh, milk and cheese categories. Uh, the saturated fats don't have these toxic anti-thyroid effects, so uh, butter and coconut oil uh, can actually help to increase your metabolic rate in thyroid while reducing inflammation. Isn't it only one teaspoon of these polyunsaturated fats a day that s starts suppressing the immune system and the thyroid? Yeah, they've looked at various animal studies to um, see where uh, the um, influence of polyunsaturated fats in increasing the cancer mortality, where it starts, and it's with four grams a day for the average human body weight. Which is one teaspoon. Yeah, uh, and that uh, even... Uh, the saturated fat foods like like milk and and coconut oil, uh, cheese and butter and so on, uh, about two percent of those fats are unsaturated. So uh, even when you're avoiding the uh, cooking oils and mayonnaise and so on, you're still uh, getting two or three grams a day of of the pufa unavoidably. And the other um, sources are if anybody ever ate fried food out in a restaurant or you didn't cook it at, your, at home with your own coconut oil, you have a lot more than one teaspoon in a serving of fried food. Yeah, and the uh, cancer mortality increases more or less in proportion to the amount of PUFA in the diet. So polyunsaturated fats include fish oil, hemp seed oil, black seed oil, canola, sunflower, soy, cotton seed. Okay, there is another caller on the air, so let's take this next caller. Corn oil, too. Hello. Hi, you're on the air. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> you had a question regarding um, parting of, of the arteries. Um, you said something about vitamin K, and also baking soda works similarly. Um, do you suggest taking that for hardening of the arteries, and how much would you take? Um. Well, vitamin K, you can get a high-potency uh, formula of a mixture of K1 and K2. Uh, and with that, I think uh, from 1 to 10 milligrams per day is up in the uh, safe range 
as well as probably being therapeutic for the wounds and arteries. And yeah. what about, um, where would you get vitamin K? And if you can't get it, can you use uh, baking soda instead? Well, uh, liver and kale are the famously rich sources. Uh, I try kale. to eat liver once or twice a month at, at least. Uh, and uh, kale is a good source. Uh, but uh, I've known uh, people who regularly take one or two teaspoons of baking soda uh, with meals or after meals uh, yeah. just just for they they notice that it increases their endurance and energy prevents fatigue and so on but interesting i i use it myself for um um heartburn it works incredibly well instantaneously and um uh, they've tested it on athletes and uh as much as a tablespoon at the start of a race can really improve their endurance and performance. But oh wow, uh, I think usually uh, uh, the amount you take for uh, st- stomach acidity is a good amount. And vitamin K, you can buy that online, a brand that's pretty pure, and it's in a um, clean oil source is Thorn Research Vitamin K Liquid. And one drop is one milligram, so... We're talking about one drop a day of this stuff. It's pretty potent. You say one drop a day? Yeah, one drop a day was, um, Dr. Feet recommended one to 15 drops of pure vitamin K. One to 10. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay, very good. Okay, so let's just quickly go back to uh, vitamin D just because uh, as we are falling into the Autumn solstice tomorrow and the daylight hours will be decreasing here at some point and we'll be getting some rain and cloud cover. Then the uh, vitamin D is many, many, many different processes are uh, supported by adequate vitamin D exposure. And um, we've talked about vitamin D in uh, relation to calcification and how vitamin D can offset calcification or uh, correct calcium deposition in the wrong place rather than putting it down in the bones. Uh, One of the things that is currently being studied is the so-called activated vitamin D1, 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol, Mm -hmm. uh, which is the kind that you make when you're deficient in calcium or vitamin D. (laughs) And it seems to have bad effects. And the the anti-aging protein clotho Mm -hmm. uh, suppresses the formation of that activated stuff so taking taking a vitamin d and calcium are having a similar effect as that anti-aging protein clotho cool all right so this was uh, clotho just a a little because i I don't know how many people will recognize the name i I must admit i didn't it's only been discovered since 98 1998 was it as a japanese sometime like that yeah and um it's a uh uh an agonist right now it's sorry uh clotho it's a beta glucuronidase right uh, uh, yeah, and no one really yet understands that apparently uh, how it works. They just know some of some of the side effects. Right, but it's uh, important as an anti-aging compound. Then. Um, yeah, and uh, they're they're doing experiments with mice. Increasing the production of it makes them live extra long. I get like thirty percent longer to have an extra dose of that protein. Hmm. But since you can do some of the same things with right. with uh, fructose, niacinamide, baking soda, and so on. Well, let's talk about some good food sources of niacinamide. Well, uh, uh, liver and milk, cheese, eggs, tortillas. Coffee? Oh, yeah, coffee. <laughs> a dark roast coffee is a very good source of also magnesium, which is uh, works against phosphate with magnesium, how many, with, with calcium. How many milligrams of a ni- niacin is in a, or niacinamide is in a cup of coffee? I figured that uh, I was getting with, with the dark roast coffee, I could get uh, close to 40 milligrams a day just from the coffee, drinking several cups. Okay. I don't think there's any more 
Court now. Okay, fine. So we've got about six minutes left to go here, so we should uh, probably not take too many more callers. But um, again, from the uh, perspective of phosphate to um, calcium intake and the uh, foods that are high in phosphate that people should probably take note of that they need adequate calcium uh, if they're going to consume these kind of foods. And I said uh, and sometime during the show that it's not an anti-vegetarianism or an anti-meat-eating uh, uh, program, but the, both of those things, the uh, beans and the nuts, as well as the meats, are fairly high in phosphates. And so calcium, as much as it's been maligned as a... Uh, uh, a problem for hardening of the arteries or that kind of thing. It's really something that people need to make sure they consume more of. And again, it's very uh, agonist, agonistic with um, vitamin, vitamin D. Whenever you eat the high phosphate foods like meat or nuts, if you are constantly having some sugar along with it, uh, fructose in the intestine uh, increases uh, the... Uh, resistance of the intestine to taking up phosphate. So it, it's like a phosphate blocker yeah. in the intestine while a, a phosphate loss promoter in the kidneys. So <clears throat> good sugar sources are, of course, fruit, fresh, ripe, juicy fruit, honey, sugar, milk has a good sugar, lactose. Those are all good sugars that have um, fructose in them or lactose is very similar in action to fructose. And um, it's sort of... A, equivalent to um, protecting against the high iron content of meat by having some coffee at the same meal. But if you put sugar in the coffee, then you're protecting against the phosphate too. And protecting your adrenal glands from (laughs) lowered blood sugar. Mm -hmm. Great. I love it. All of those things that they would have told you are bad for you are actually the things that are good for you. So, um, Obviously, the saturated fats, animal fats, very good for you, calcium, lots of milk, very good for you, cheese. Um, I think our ancestors had it figured out how to make it from definitely had it figured out. Okay. thousands of years ago till now. <laughs> and uh, I think we can't reinvent the wheel with all of our modern-day processed foods. That's right. We're just coming, coming back to where we came from. So I'm glad that there's... Uh, Research showing that a phosphate uh, adulteration, if you want to call it, in meats is actually showing itself to be a potential problem. Uh, as always, I think the industrialization or mechanization of our food industry uh, turns up compounds that are cheap uh, and no doubt make money, and that's why they're added, but not always, not always good. So anyway, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Pete. I'll let people know uh, how to get hold of you. Okay, and, thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for joining, joining us. us again. Okay, so it's a couple of minutes to the top of the hour. Uh, anyone that's listened to the show, uh, if you go to www.raypeat.com, uh, look at the home page then, uh, you'll find a link to the articles. And the articles, there's probably about 50, I think, 50 or maybe 60 articles the last time I looked. And uh, many of them, well, all of them are fully referenced, but many of them uh, will be around the subjects of aging and uh, things like we've talked about this evening with phosphate and aging and the anti-aging effects of some of the hormones we've mentioned, things like thyroid hormone, um, and we've talked about pregnenolone, progesterone, etc. in the past. But those things are kind of anti-aging. So his website's got a great, uh, great source of reference material. Uh, he's a research endocrinologist, so he knows what he's talking about. And, um, yeah, our, our phone number is uh, 1-800-1888, beg your pardon, WBM Herb. Uh, we can be reached anytime uh, after the show, Monday through Friday. Sarah? Thank you for listening. We enjoyed the show. Thank you, Dr. Pete. Yeah, thank you so much.